2023. It's going to be a good year in the markets. Let's see what our favorite financial YouTubers are predicting. 2023 recession. Massive housing recession just started. The worst global recession is here? What is happening? Housing prices are collapsing? Massive crypto risk ahead? Well, yeah, that tracks actually. Wait, Graham's selling his stocks? Oh, this is getting worse. The layoffs? Oh man, oh man, the end of the US dollar, no. No, I gotta call my bank. China's striking back. Oh no, the 2023 Great Depression. Oh man, America's going bankrupt. I gotta, I gotta unlock my bunker. Oh man, Americans are gonna run out of money by January 1st. Okay, deep breath. I'm sure these guys are just trolling for clicks and the Wall Street analysts are more optimistic, right? JP Morgan, our core scenario sees developed economies falling into a mild recession in 2023. All right, BlackRock, equity valuations don't yet reflect the damage ahead in our view. Taming inflation would take deep recession. Dang. Morgan Stanley, an inverted yield curve hints at a potential economic slowdown at some point in the year ahead. We're scaling back on mega cap stocks. All right. Fidelity, in our view, a hard landing remains the most likely outcome in 2023. <sighs> okay. Wells Fargo, we expect a U.S. recession in the first half of 2023. A city, uh, we believe the Fed's current tightening will reduce nominal spending growth by more than half, raise U.S. unemployment above 5%, and cause a 10% decline in corporate earnings. Several months later. The S&P rising nearly six-tenths of a percent today, closing less than a percentage point from its all-time high. The benchmark index is now up nearly 16% from its October lows and is almost 25% higher on the year. How were Wall Street and YouTube so wrong about the stock market in 2023? They said that stocks would be down, that we should play defense, and they peddled fear. To be fair, there was a lot of uncertainty coming off a brutal 2022 in the stock market. And most Wall Street analysts, they're always going to assume that the near future looks very much like the recent past. They'll never stray too far from consensus thinking. The YouTubers like Andre and Graham, they make those fear-based titles and videos because they know us sickos will keep clicking them. They know that fear sells. But for investors who put real capital on the line, we can't make our investing decisions based on emotion or based on what happened last year. So with that in mind, today's video is my investing outlook for 2024. I'll start by looking at the current big picture in the economy and the stock market, and then I'll talk about some potential investing themes that I think could be big in 2024, and I'm sure that I'll get some things wrong along the way. And you, as always, have to make your own investing decisions. But let's get rolling. As we wrap up 2023, it has been a wild and surprising year in financial markets. Stocks have surged to end the year, and most stock indices will end well into the green here in 2023 which is perhaps a little bit of a surprising result. And it hasn't been easy. The S&P 500, for instance, has had a 1,000 point differential between the low for the year and the high for the year. Even looking at things like 10-year US Treasury yields, they've been as low as 3.25% this year and as high as 5%. In fact, at one point, we had CNBC talking heads like Rick Santelli saying that the 10-year Treasury rate could hit 13%. Just absurd, absurd stuff. But the economy and corporate earnings also had a really interesting roller coaster year. In the first two quarters of the year, corporate earnings were actually down year over year, and then they rebounded to growth in the third quarter. The U.S. economy printed a GDP growth number of almost 5% in the third quarter, surprising a lot of people who thought that the economy would shrink when we started the year. Now, of course, one of the major themes has been inflation and the interest rate response from central banks. And inflation is finally on a cooling path after being at ridiculous rates of inflation in 2021 and 2022. Now you might say, Travis, listen, it's all just manipulated data. Inflation's not actually cooling, <laughs> but hear me out. We have all these different inflation measures from CPI to PPI to PCE, and that's just in the US alone. And all those measures confirm that we're seeing cooling inflation. We also see that inflation is cooling on a global basis. You can see it's not just the US, but other countries are finally seeing a moderation of inflation. And what is driving that? Of course, we've got some help from energy prices. We've got some help from the fact that the way inflation is measured on year over year basis, we're gonna just naturally see a decline if things aren't inflating as quickly as they were. The other major thing that's happening in the US, of course, is the rent component of inflation measures. Rent is an extremely lagged measure. So in 2022, rental prices and home prices actually flattened out after a huge increase in the prior two years. But that flattening of rent prices has not been reflected in the official inflation data because the official inflation data has a like 12 to 18 month lag 
when it comes to the rental measures. So if you look here, you can see that, you know, rents have really flattened out in the actual real-time rent measures measures from companies like apartment list or zillow but the cpi numbers are just now seeing a rollover in the rate of inflation in the shelter components and these are the largest components of the cpi so we will continue to see downward pressure on some of the inflation measures in the us just because of the lagged effect of lower rent inflation that we saw in late 2022 and early 2023 and in fact, if you strip out shelter costs, you look at the CPI excluding shelter costs, it's already down well below 2% over the past few months of readings. And we also see that if we look at forecasts of rent inflation from different banks or central banks, we can see that they are expecting in 2024, the trend of rental inflation slowing to continue. So that will continue to put downward pressure. In fact, the bond market is currently predicting that we're actually gonna be as low as 2% inflation rates in the US by the end of 2024. Now, that means with the Fed's fund rate at 5.25% currently and inflation coming down to the 3% or below level here, real rates, the rate, of, the rate of interest that we have minus the rate of inflation are actually nicely positive and in fact in restrictive territory. These are the highest real rates we've had in a number of years. And so with the Fed being up at 5.25, inflation coming down to three or below, they've actually got room now to actually cut rates. And the Fed's not the only central bank that has room to do that. Other central banks do as well. But the market now expects, expects rate cuts from the Fed in 2024. Maybe too many rate cuts, but currently the market is expecting the Fed to start cutting rates at a 25 basis point rate cut level at the March meeting and then basically at every meeting through nearly the end of the year. So we can argue about whether that's actually going to happen or not, but that's currently what the market is predicting via the futures market for federal funds. Now, that has also helped global bond yields, whether it's U.S. Treasuries or other, US, or other government bonds, decline recently, just in the last couple of months. You know, we had that counter trend earlier in the year where yields were rising and we had this whole higher for longer, uh, you know, idea that people were espousing and we were worried. We were worried about the trajectory, especially of longer term bond yields and just bond yields generally. It was making credit costs higher for not only governments, but also for consumers and for businesses. We were seeing, you know, 30 year mortgage rates in the US go up above seven or eight percent at one point. So now those bond yields are finally cooling again with the cooling of inflation and the expectation of rate cuts. Through all of this, the U.S. economy and the global economy really in general has been surprisingly resilient. I mentioned that U.S. GDP growth was almost 5% in the third quarter. Now for the fourth quarter, the Atlanta Fed's GDP now figure is suggesting perhaps somewhere between 2 and 3% GDP growth. I think if we had... If you had told people that at the beginning of 2023 that that would be the growth rate, they would be pleasantly surprised. One of the things underpinning this strong economic growth or the resilient economic growth is, of course, low unemployment. Another thing that people were surprised about, people thought that unemployment would rise over 5% this year, that the lagged effects of monetary policy would create more job losses and higher unemployment, but unemployment remains below 4% in the U.S. It remains at very, very low levels. Even if we look at more real-time measures like weekly unemployment claims, they're still very, very low. They're just above 200,000 per week. In fact, we typically don't even worry about these numbers until they're well over 300,000 or somewhere in that 300 to 500,000 range on a weekly basis. And the trend certainly looks good as well in weekly unemployment. Now, we have seen some cracks, perhaps in some of the leading indicators of the job market, things like job openings or the number of workers taking on part-time work. Those things are suggesting perhaps some weakening around the edges. And we have seen job losses in certain sectors like tech, but that has been more than offset by gains in areas like retail and leisure and travel. Now, if we think about the drivers of economic growth, whether it's in the consumer sector, the business sector, the government sector, Things look pretty good. If we go through all these categories, I just talked about unemployment, you know, consumer sentiment certainly is improving with better growth, better stock prices. We also have wealth effects for the consumer that seem to be improving. Of course, global stock prices being up help, you know, bond prices being up help. And of course, housing prices being more stable, that also helps. In fact, there is some evidence that housing prices are actually now maybe increasing again in some areas. So certainly that's gonna give a positive wealth effect to consumers. On the business side, I mentioned that earnings are actually growing again here in the back half of 2023. And we also have potentially some effect on business investment with lower interest rates. So with yields coming down, that will reduce borrowing costs for businesses and potentially encourage them to invest in new growth projects or acquire other companies or invest in other parts of the business. On the government side, it's a little less clear. We know that fiscal spending is currently 
very, very stimulative. We are running here in the US about a 6% deficit to GDP level. So that continues to be overall stim stimulative to the economy. And that is something that has been helping, you know, prop up some of the economic sectors. But it's a little bit muddy because in 2024, we of course will have federal elections. So there could be a shift of power and there could be changing priorities when it comes to the budget. So that one, you know, while it is stimulative today, could be something that changes and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But if we look at some of these other metrics, things like interest rates and credit spreads, you know, we're really not seeing anything that's too concerning. Corporate debt levels are quite low. Corporate credit spreads remain very, very thin, meaning the, the amount that corporations have to pay in excess of the prevailing bond rates, their actual you know, credit spreads that they pay as, as corporations, those are very, very low. So you know, if the government's borrowing at 5%, your average corporation that's in pretty good health might be borrowing at 6%. So these corporate credit spreads remain very tight, very healthy, not suggesting any imminent credit stress for most businesses or for your average businesses. And of course, we see across most sectors, again, stock prices up across most sectors. There have been some laggards like, you know, the solar sector, the alternative energy sector had a tough year as higher interest rates really depressed demand in some of those sectors. Uh, but overall, you can see most industries had a pretty good year when it comes to stock prices. And that will help not only co companies in terms of sentiment, but it can help give them some currency to go to acquisitions or to, you know, give stock based compensation and things like that. So overall, U.S. market sentiment right now for investors is pretty good. It's gotten pretty bullish. Now, we do have to be a little bit careful. We don't want to get into extreme greed territory again. Uh, you would hope that we can remain a little bit more in just the slightly bullish territory. But right now, we are looking at increasingly bullish sentiment in the U.S. market. We started the year in a much more bearish sentiment. Of course, there were times during the year where we flipped into bearish sentiment, things like March when the, the Silicon Valley bank failure happened. But right now, as it stands today in December of 2023, current U.S. market sentiment is pretty good. When it comes to valuations, of course, the story is a little bit neutral. We have seen valuations rise, particularly among certain sectors like large cap tech and just tech in general this year in 2023. So we went from at times seeing very, very cheap valuations in the market to ending the year on a pretty neutral level. If you look at the history of the S&P 500's forward P.E. ratio, We've certainly been higher during, you know, very bubbly periods like the dot-com bubble or in early 2021, uh, but right now sitting just under 20 times earnings for the S&P 500, and that is maybe not cheap, but also, again, not super, super expensive. When it comes to small caps, small caps are still pretty undervalued relative to large caps or relative to broader market measures. Small caps have seen a nice surge recently, but they still trade for a little bit less than 15 times forward earnings if you look at some of the small cap indices valuations. We also see some dispersion by sectors. If you look at certain sectors like energy and financials, they have low PE ratios that are well below the market average. And of course, you have things like tech and large tech that are well above the market average. Now, if we look at the best performing stocks of 2023, I've actually sorted the S&P 500 members from best to worst here. And this data is through December 21st as I'm recording the video. You can see that a couple major investing themes have emerged in 2023. The first obvious one is AI, and NVIDIA was the best performing stock year to date in the S&P 500, up over 200%. The company not only delivered robust growth in revenues and earnings, but it was also smack dab in the middle of the AI hype train. <laughs> we also saw other chip makers like AMD and Intel and Broadcom do very well. We saw some of the equipment manufacturers like Lamb Research and Applied Materials make the list. Even memory maker Micron was one of the better performers this year. So that was a very obvious theme that did quite well across the board. We also saw another major theme was travel that performed quite well. Royal Caribbean, Carnival Corp, even Uber. We had Airbnb, Expedia, and Booking Holdings all make the top 100 best performers. I actually tweeted about this in late 2022 as a potential opportunity. I saw those stocks trading at pretty low multiples despite the fact that we were continuing to see robust recovery in travel demand. One surprising sector that performed quite well was home building. And this was surprising because we know interest rates are rising through most of the year in 2023 until the latter part of the year. And we had mortgage rates over 7 or 8% at one point. Nonetheless, the home builders, to their credit, have been offering really strong rebates to buyers. And there remained a continued gap between the demand for homes in the U.S., which is still quite strong, and the supply, particularly of lower price new home supply. There just isn't that much. So the home builders continue to grow their earnings, and they also saw multiple expansion. So that was another theme that did very well. Now, what didn't do so well? A pretty surprising one was consumer staples. You would have thought, 
particularly in a choppy volatile year that staples would have held up a lot better than they did. A lot of these staple stocks like Hormel, General Mills, Hershey, they did quite poorly. And one of the interesting themes regarding staples is the GLP-1s or the Ozempics, the, the class of drugs that are starting to reduce obesity in a certain population in the U.S. And they're seen as a potential for massive blockbuster status in the years ahead because these drugs have proven very effective at weight loss for a number of individuals in the U.S., particularly those who are diabetics or extremely overweight. So investors started to wonder, could this actually reduce the demand for sodas, for sweets, for packaged goods in the U.S. if basically U.S. citizens get less fat on average? <laughs> now, I think the jury's still out on the total impact of this, but certainly I think on the margin, we would expect that this will have at least some impact in the years ahead. To recap my own personal best and worst trades, uh, it was a pretty good year for me. And some of these trades I actually called out publicly like GBTC and the travel stocks. You can see I tweeted about these, you know, over a year ago in some cases. Uh, all these trades I also alerted to members of our Skill Incubator community. So if you're interested in getting my alerts, you can go check out that info in the description. The other big theme for me was large tech stocks like Meta and Netflix, where I could see a path to higher margins despite the narrative out there, which was very bearish on big tech at the end of 2022. One of the problems with big tech at the end of 2022 was margins had declined. They were still spending like drunken sailors. They had hired too many people in the post-COVID period. And Meta in particular was not only overstaffed, but they were spending way too much money and losing a ton of money on things like the metaverse. Of course, we know now Mark Zuckerberg committed to the year of efficiency at Meta, and that gave me the confidence to buy more at the lows. And the stock had a dual tailwind of earnings growth and multiple expansion as Meta proved that they could cut headcount. In fact, they had multiple reductions in headcount. They got more efficient and they delivered better results on the top and bottom line. That also happened at Netflix. I exited that one a little bit early, but still was able to capture a nice trade there. Spotify, a little bit slow on the year of efficient efficiency train, but they have committed to work on the margin side at Spotify, which has been a big issue for them. But that stock is up a lot this year, so that's done quite well. Also took some swing trades on things like uh, uranium miner calls, that did quite well. Uh, Zscaler, a cybersecurity company, had a major drawdown at one point in the year, despite the fact that it was growing top line at 40% year over year, one of the fastest growing stocks in tech. And so was able to get that one at the right time. Also participated in an event trade, the Spirit merger with JetBlue, the merger arbitrage situation. That one hasn't fully played out yet, but it's uh, up in profit. So knock on wood, that one will also contribute hopefully in 2024. Now, it doesn't mean I was always right. In 2023, I had some misses for sure, uh, particularly trades that I didn't enter into that I should have. And NVIDIA was an obvious one. Uh, I'd made a short video at the beginning of the year saying why I was avoiding NVIDIA. At the time, I think in the first quarter, NVIDIA was actually seeing a decline year over year in revenues. And then very quickly by the spring, it became obvious that the demand for generative AI and for NVIDIA chips was just off the charts. <laughs> I was completely wrong about that. NVIDIA stock just mooned. And then, of course, I also, you can see the video I made just a couple of months ago on crypto miners. I had seen that they were underperforming Bitcoin and I thought, well, they're probably going to continue to underperform Bitcoin leading up to the halving. So I'm going to stay out of those. Those, of course, have caught back up to Bitcoin and more and they've ripped higher in recent weeks. So that was not a great one. A couple other ones I exited around break even, like I took a swing trade on, on Alaska Airlines and on Blackline, which had some M&A rumors, things like that. Of course, PayPal didn't really go anywhere this year. It's, it was about flattish from my average cost base. So that one's still TBD. But now we're talking about 2024. Let's focus on the future. My 2024 big picture is this. I think the playbook changes from 2023. 2023, as investors, we were so focused, at least on the macro side, on interest rates and inflation, on this higher for longer idea. You know, the Fed was continuing to raise rates. We were worried about what will that impact look like on the economy. And we were worried how high will rates need to go because inflation wasn't coming down as fast as many of us would have liked. Now that has shifted. Now we can see clear evidence that inflation is cooling globally. So now we shift to an environment of rate cuts rather than rate hikes. I think we also start to shift our focus from this sole focus on inflation and we'll start to think more again about, well, how is the economy performing? Could the economy just weaken on its own in 2024 with all this you know, uncertainty about things like elections? Elections are another big theme for 2024. We have more than 60% of the global population will be voting in elections. So we've got elections not only in the U.S. at the federal level, which will be very, very impactful, but we also have elections in major countries like India and Mexico and a number of other countries globally. So this is going to be a very big year for governments, for government policy, and potentially for changes to 
the direction in things like fiscal spending and government budgets. And so that's going to have a very big impact potentially on how markets perform this year. The story around corporate earnings will also be a big focus for me in 2024. 2023 was a surprising year where we actually did see corporate earnings growth rebound. They declined in the first two quarters of the year, and then they rebounded in the second half. But everyone's now certain that corporate earnings are going to rip higher in 2024. And I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I don't know if growth is going to materialize as much, particularly if we have fewer corporations raising prices in response to inflation, particularly if we have fewer places to cut headcount now that you know tech has done so many headcount cuts in 2022 and 2023. And so it's a little bit more murky for me when it comes to corporate earnings growth. I think we'll probably get corporate earnings growth. I'm just not sure we're going to get get that growth to the level that analysts currently expect. Currently, analysts are expecting as high as 12% earnings growth in the S&P 500. You can see here are some of the different numbers for each sector. I mean, healthcare and tech expected to grow earnings more than 15%. That's very, very good. Here you can see 2024 earnings estimates have started to weaken. They haven't actually gone up. <laughs> now, this is somewhat of a typical pattern. We do see analysts on Wall Street get a little bit over-optimistic about future earnings growth. And then as reality hits as we get the first couple quarters of earnings delivered, we do tend to see a little bit of moderation in the growth estimates. So maybe that's what we're seeing now with 2024 estimates. Again, we're still seeing, you know, very robust estimates between 10 and 12% growth for the year. But, you know, even if we finish at six or 7% earnings growth, I think that would still be okay, but it could lead to some bumps along the way if earnings are disappointing and particularly among certain sectors. If we think about other areas where the economy could be at risk, you know, one thing I will note is that consumer credit delinquencies have been on the rise. If you look at the credit card data from major card issuers or major banks like JP Morgan, uh, Capital One, companies like that that are public, we can see, and you can see here I've charted JP Morgan's charge off rates, 30 day delinquencies, 90 day delinquencies, and those have started to rise in recent months. So that would be one concern that maybe the health of the consumer isn't quite as strong as a lot of people believe. Now, right now, you could make the case that consumer credit delinquencies are just normalizing back to their pre-pandemic levels, and that is also a possibility. But we need to see them flatten out. We don't want to see them keep rising. So this is something I'm going to keep watching very, very closely. Another thing worth watching is the manufacturing sector. We've seen the manufacturing sector remain quite weak. Now, in the U.S., manufacturing is less than 10% of the overall economy. But again, it's very cyclical and it can often indicate weakness in things like goods, goods demand, consumer health, et cetera. So it might be a little bit concerning that the manufacturing sector is still technically shrinking according to the data that we have. The US ISM PMI is below 50, indicating contraction in manufacturing. Now, the other thing that we'll, of course, continue to watch is inflation. I'm not saying that inflation will be of no concern. One area that we're watching is services inflation, because even though we have things like rent coming down, energy prices coming down, there are areas where inflation has actually rebounded a little bit just in the past couple of months. So services inflation is one area that I've got a little bit of concern that we're going to have to keep an eye on. That could be an area that keeps inflation a little bit more sticky and could lead the Fed or other central banks to maybe not cut rates as fast as investors would like. So all of this means that we're going to have uncertainty in 2024. Like any other year, there's going to be market corrections. So we must expect there's going to be some market corrections in 2024. There are going to be things that freak out investors that investors become worried about. And if you look at the history of market corrections, you know, we get a good 5% market correction a couple times a year on average. There's very few years where we don't get at least a 5% correction in the broad market average. And that, of course, means there'll be even further or deeper corrections in individual stocks. So expect market corrections. My goal is to try to take advantage of market corrections and buy good companies that are still growing at better prices when that happens. Of course, a positive is that we think that M&A activity and IPO activity will rise in 2024. We'll finally see more companies coming public again, and we'll see more capital markets activity. So we've got Renaissance Capital projecting that IPOs will increase. Uh, we've got some companies that I think you'd probably be interested in that could end up potentially having their IPO in 2024, companies like Stripe or Databricks, a very hot AI snowflake type of company. Uh, we've got some companies like Liquid Death or Shein on the consumer side that could even IPO. So Reddit maybe another big one. We don't know. Uh, but certainly those are some companies in the mix that have shown that they're at least preparing for a potential IPO and might actually try to come to market in 2024. We shall see. But I do think it will be a busier year for IPOs in 2024. 
So I mentioned some of those themes that we saw in 2023, but what about 2024? What do I personally think could remain hot or get hot in terms of themes? Because we know themes will often drive baskets of stocks higher. So AI, I think obviously this one's very clear. We're still in an AI boom. Generative AI just keeps getting better. But text to video is another exciting area where you'll be able to describe something and then it could generate a video. And we've seen companies like Pika, Synthesia, and other companies really, really rapidly improving on text to video capabilities. That's going to be an exciting one. But we'd love to see some more IPOs, certainly in the AI arena. I think crypto obviously will be a big, big theme because we're starting 2024 with crypto already very, very hot. And we know that there's going to be a big event with a potential ETF approvals for Bitcoin spot ETFs in the first or second week of January. We also know that there is going to be a halving event for Bitcoin around the April-May timeframe. Now, halving events have tended in the past to lead to price gains post-halving. I don't know if we're going to get the typical pattern this time around, but certainly there's going to be activity around crypto. There's going to be volatility and maybe the altcoin season may be back on if Bitcoin and Ethereum remain strong. But what about some sectors that are more under the radar that I think could actually have a resurgence in 2024? One of those sectors would be cannabis. You know, the cannabis sector is extremely beaten up. It's down more than 70% since 2022. The sector has been waiting for a regulatory catalyst such as the passage of the Safe Banking Act, but Congress just keeps dragging their feet. However, interestingly, the Department of Health and Human Services recommended to the Drug Enforcement Agency in 2023 that the DEA reschedule cannabis to something less severe under federal law. And we think that the DEA could come forward sometime around the middle of 2024 and actually propose that rescheduling. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, it would have direct financial implications for a lot of the cannabis dispensary operators who are in this MSOS ETF, and many of which are publicly traded, it would allow them to deduct things like business expenses for tax purposes. So it would directly help them improve earnings and improve their ability to generate cash flows. I think 2024 could be the year, and we have a sector that is very, very washed out from a sentiment perspective. Also, I think energy is an area where, you know, even though we've had declining energy prices in 2023, there's still always that potential for energy prices to surge. And I, like I showed, showed before, the energy sector is one of the cheapest when you're just looking at pure price to earnings ratios. And another interesting thing that I've noticed is that the rig count in North America has been falling, at least for crude oil rigs in North America. And so that could suggest that maybe at some point we get more discipline from the production side. And we know also, of course, OPEC Plus has been trying to put in quotas for production to try to contain any supply demand imbalances. So could we see energy prices rise again in 2024? I think it's a decent probability. We also have a lot of uncertainty over new government regimes that could add volatility to energy markets. So I think energy is an area definitely to keep an eye on. And I personally want to have some energy exposure just as a pure hedge against a reflation scenario. China is a sector that is very hated. <laughs> you know, the K-Web China ETF is down more than 20% over the past five years. Some of the Chinese big tech stocks like Alibaba and JD trade at single digit earnings multiples or basically at like one third of the valuation multiples that large US tech trades at. Okay, I get it. There's this big trade war between China and the US. We know that the Chinese government has taken aim at their own tech companies in the past with certain regulations. So there's issues. And we know that the structure of the Chinese companies that are trading in public markets are a little bit problematic. They're VIE structures that are basically based out of the Caribbean. And so there's a question as to if something were to happen, would the shares get potentially taken away from you as an American investor? Do you really own that stake in the Chinese company? Uh, but I think, you know, at these prices, a lot of that risk is actually kind of priced in. And so I think Chinese stocks could have some significant upside in 2024, especially because as I look at what a lot of the Wall Street strategists are saying about China, they're saying, oh, it's going to be another year of economic weakness in China. You know, the economy is going to disappoint again. The government's fiscal spending measures are not helping improve the economy, yada, yada, yada. This is where I think it gets interesting because this is something where the consensus is continuing to think that China is going to look just like it has over the past 12 months. And I think there could actually be a change. We've seen things like Chinese retail sales start to inflect upwards. In fact, the most recent month was growth of more than 10% in Chinese retail sales. So I think that there is a potential here for Chinese stocks to play some catch up in 2024 and surprise a lot of people. So that is an area where I've just recently taken a little bit of exposure. Now, I do keep my position sizing conservative because of the unique risks of China as an American investor, but certainly an area I think could surprise to the upside. I think even things like small caps could continue to gain a little bit of ground against large caps. 
We saw the NASDAQ put in over 50% year-to-date performance. I wouldn't expect that to happen again in 2024. However, it's interesting. I did run the data. I wrote about this in the Daily Doe new- newsletter the other day. I looked at the performance of the NASDAQ in years where it put up 30% or higher returns. And then I looked at what was the percentage change in the NASDAQ the following year. And there was really only one or two years where you had a major downturn after such a large performance, which is kind of surprising. You'd think after a massive year in the NASDAQ that it would have a cooling off in the following year. But in a lot of years, in the majority of years, you actually had more follow through where you had another good positive year. So you can see those those here. It is a small sample size, of course. There's not many years where the NASDAQ has put up 30% plus returns, but it's it's interesting to see nonetheless. Now, hopefully 2023 isn't like 1999 <laughs> because the following year we know the NASDAQ fell a lot. But NASDAQ and big tech, I think a lot of the easy gains were probably made, especially because a lot of those cost cuts are going to be probably a little harder to come by in the years ahead. In any case, I think it's important for us to put our contrarian thinking caps on for 2024 And I'm not sure that big tech is going to be the big story of 2024. You know, if we're looking in the rear view, maybe that's the case, but I doubt they'll be at the top of the 2024 leaderboard. So what will and what will create the conditions for that? That's why I like to think about what could defy expectations that currently exist today. So one of those things I mentioned, Chinese stocks and the Chinese economy, I think there's a potential for that to surprise to the upside because so many Americans in particular just don't really have a good grasp of what's actually happening on the ground there. And I think there are signs that the Chinese economy could be stronger than expected. The Fed, maybe they don't cut rates at every single Fed meeting next year. That's what the market is currently expecting. We flipped into this really aggressive rate cut situation, but what if that doesn't happen? What if the Fed cuts a few times and needs to pause? What if energy prices spike and causes the Fed to pause? What if, you know, long-term yields remain high, even if the Fed does cut? You know, that could actually have an effect on borrowing costs for businesses and consumers if things like the 10-year, the 20-year, the 30-year treasury yields remain high despite rate cuts. And so that's another Thing that could put some pressure on overall growth, even if the short-term rates get cut. Energy, of course, does have the lowest price to earnings multiple of any sector right now. So if you get earnings growth in the sector and you get a little bit of multiple expansion, it could easily be the best performing sector, whereas it's been a very weak sector over the past few years. So that's an area that could surprise a lot, a lot of investors who just aren't positioned to be long that much energy. What if tech stocks have a boring year? You know, that would be maybe a baseline expectation for me because a lot of investors are either expecting the run to continue in the NASDAQ or maybe a massive reversion to the mean where they underperform. What if they just trade in a tight range or bounce around and are choppy but don't really post really any significant negative or positive returns next year? I think that is a strong possibility for tech, which probably needs a little bit of a breather after just an insane 2023 run. And then when it comes to crypto, what about Bitcoin miners, Bitcoin stocks, Bitcoin itself? What if it's a buy the rumor, sell the news event, not only for the ETF approval, but for the halving? What if we actually get to those events and it turns out that they're not as bullish for price action as we thought? You know, that'll be interesting to see how the crypto ecosystem reacts if, say, ETF approval comes and Bitcoin just doesn't go up very much. (laughs) Will there be a sell off after that? What will happen? Then, of course, you have the couple months leading up to the halving. You know, what's going to happen there? I think there's a lot of uncertainty, and I don't think it's as clear as maybe some investors are making it out to be. And again, I think there could be a buy the rumor, sell the news on one or both of these major crypto events. So that's something to think about as well if you're heavily, deeply involved on the crypto side. So those are just some things that I've been thinking about that could change or defy expectations. You know, we're going to obviously look deep into what's happening with the elections. I'm going to spend some time, probably do a video on what that could mean for stocks, depending on who wins, both at the presidential level and at the congressional level. Certainly, that'll be a big focus for investors. I'll also be thinking about things like alternative energy, one of the worst performing sectors in 2023. Perhaps they could see a reversal of their fortunes from last year's bad year. And there's one stock in particular in that sector that I have a small investment in. So I'm hopefully going to do some more work on that, maybe do a video on that one. Look out for that. And if you're interested in getting alerts on what I'm actually personally investing in, you can join our Skill Incubator community. Check that out. Of course, we also, I also have my Twitter account and my free Daily Doe newsletter where I talk about stuff and give ideas. So I'll be continuing to do that throughout 2024. So hopefully this was helpful, but let me know in the comments if you have any ideas for what you think could defy expectations, what you think could end up becoming one of the best performers, if it's an individual stock or a sector going into 2024. Let's think outside the box. Let's help each other. Let's do some digging and find the stuff that's going to be the next NVIDIA. I hope you have a great end of your year and great start to 2024. I'll see you soon. Cheers.